In this episode, we speak with professor, author, speaker, Jennifer Bay Williams. Dr. Bay Williams is an internationally respected mathematics educator, a prolific author, and popular speaker on topics related to effective mathematics teaching and instruction. Her most recent work has focused on fluency in mathematics, communicating that it is more than learning facts and algorithms, but is all about being able to reason and choose appropriate strategies. In our episode, we chat with Jennifer about how we can help students and parents build flexibility and efficiency around basic math facts. Stick around until the end and you'll hear great tips on how you can easily build fluency into your classroom. Let's do it. Welcome to the Making Math Moments That Matter podcast. I'm Kyle Pierce. And I'm John Orr. We are from makingmathmoments.com and together with you, the community of math moment makers worldwide, we want to build and deliver math lessons that spark curiosity, fuel sense making, and ignite your amazing teacher moves. My friends, math moment makers, we have the privilege and honor of speaking with Jennifer Bay Williams here today, uh, who, as we mentioned, has done so much in the math space. Um, where I was first exposed to Jennifer's work is through the Teaching Developmentally book for elementary and middle school mathematics. Mm, right. um, that is a John Vandewall uh, and co or and team um, um, book. And it is fantastic. And actually she talks about, uh, just briefly about how the 11th edition just got released. Mm -hmm. Um, I actually leveraged that resource as I wrote the, um, the proportional reasoning course there, the concept holding your students back. That was like my main sort of, you know, guide as I was learning and understanding ratios, rates, and proportional reasoning in ways that I had never really understood them before. Um, and now we're deep into their fact fluency series, which we're going to talk all about here on the episode. Uh, John, it was an awesome conversation. Uh, what was uh, maybe your big takeaway or something interesting that resonated with you before we dig in? Yeah, I uh, like you said, the work that she's been doing has heavily influenced what we've been doing. Uh, uh, you know, I, I'm reminded of her figuring out fluency book series, uh, that you also so referenced is, is that we, we ran a webinar not too long ago. We referenced her work on, you know, specifically about worksheets and how you can build fluency and how we can use worksheets in a very specific and particular way to do that. She's got some great ideas on how to do that. We're going to talk about them here in this episode as well. So let's get into it. And, uh, Here's the conversation with Jennifer. Hey, hey there, Jenny. Thank you for joining us here on the Making Math Moments That Matter podcast. How are things going in your world? Uh, sounds like things are pretty busy as usual. Yeah, things are busy, but they're going great. I'm thrilled to say that the Fluency series is done. It's out. So that means that mm -hmm. um, I'm not juggling the writing and the speaking as much. So um, that's been great. And it's the beginning of a semester. Um, on the, you know, at the university campus that I work at. So things are buzzing around campus as well. Amazing. Amazing. Yeah. I mean, we are definitely going to be diving into that series. Uh, I know that Kyle and I read, I think the, the high school ver version and the, and the, uh, the algebra concepts with, uh, some proportional reasoning. So I'm excited to chat with you about all of that. Um, Jenny, tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, and our, our listeners, uh, probably will want to know that where are you coming from right now? Um, you know, and also give us a little backstory into, your journey into education a lot of our listeners want to want to know about our guests and like how do you get from where you were like starting your career into where you are now all right so i'll try to keep this short <laughs> but mm. first of all i went through high school thinking i could never be a teacher they work too hard they get up too early and I went off to college not knowing what I wanted to do. Um, and then I signed up to volunteer at an elementary school. And I um, worked with a boy who was struggling with his basic facts, which is poignant for me um, today. My life is, as you know, because I'm really passionate about um, basic fact fluency. Um, that experience um, was so profound that I enrolled in my first education class. So that was um, just a one day in day in the life. And uh, luckily, I signed up to volunteer that day. Um, and then fast forward to teaching. 
And I'm teaching in my class. I'm a middle school teacher. I'm noticing that students are doing goofy things like Hmm. using a standard algorithm when they don't need one. Mm -hmm. And they don't really like math. What? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Shocker. (laughs) I'm teaching kids that don't like it and it doesn't make sense to them. And so I really, I, I took graduate classes. I started thinking harder about this and other ways to teach the um, standards were just coming out in the in the U.S., the original standards, by the way, because I'm old. Um, hmm. And so I started thinking about helping students make sense of what they were learning. And um, then I started thinking, I need to work beyond my classroom. I got to work at the school level. And um, to do that, I need you know to learn more. And I then I got an interest in writing and I wrote my first book. And uh, that's another way to just advocate for um, effective math teaching. And fast forward uh, 20 years, and here I am. (laughs) Uh, That is fantastic. What a story. And it's great. We always love to start at the beginning because there are so many educators out there. And it's not just in education. It's in any space where... You know, when people are are successful and confident and doing great work, oftentimes, you know, we have this idea in our mind like they always were there, you know, like they always had it together. They always knew what to do. And it was almost like it was innate. And, you know, just like in math where, you know, we're not math people or not math people. It's like those experiences, the learning along the way. And, and it sounds like that lifelong learner in you has allowed you to, you know, start from never thinking you could be a teacher to doing what you're doing now. And, you know, I'm I'm picturing how you were envisioning the world as a teacher when you were in high school and you weren't even considering the fact of writing, speaking, <laughs> so consulting, true. chatting on podcasts like we are here <laughs> and look at you now. So just, you know, just showing how things change, things evolve over time. I think it's always great to highlight those messages. Uh, I want to take a moment and go back again to ask you the question we ask everyone on the podcast. So everyone's always waiting for it. And it is, what would you say your math moment as a learner would be? We don't limit it through from K through 12. It could be, you know, later in life as well. But as you, as a math learner, what's that moment that pops into your mind when you think math class? Um, do you, do you want I, us to give you a small example? <laughs> give me an example. <laughs> sure. Sure. Yeah. So for example, like, uh, some people say, um, something that, that was a, a negative experience that, uh, that just stuck with them. Like that's what my math moment is, uh, similar to Kyle's, but some people say like a positive math moment. Uh, so for example, like mine is I have this very vivid memory. Uh, when I think of math class, I, I think of my, like, it was grade four. And I was, um, my teacher used to give me multiplication uh, questions. Uh, You know, you're you're practicing, I think was one digit by two digit multiplication, or it might even been two digit by two digit multiplication. It was just like one after the other. And uh, my, myself, I, I was a very, uh, you know, I, I was, I was the student that would be like, give me the rules. I will, I will mimic those and I will, and I will do it a million times just because I know the mm-hmm. rules and that's and feel good about it. Yeah. And, 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 and so I, I would get some, and then the teacher said, you know, you can do these extra ones if you like. And so I remember going home and just pounding out pages of these one by two digit numbers and coming back. And then all of a sudden I have this like big sticker on my book Hmm. right and it's like this not normal sticker it's one of those like puffy uh hologram stickers and it's like just memory stuck out but then but then why that memory stuck out is because not too long later actually i found this uh not too long ago my mom had had saved some of my grade four work and i had this i had this (laughs) test that had like eight out of out of like 25 on it as a mark you know and and i remember having that sticker but then all of a sudden this mark was saying like you know what i could do these things but then actually when i had to like try different strategies i i was terrible at it and and it just stuck out for me to say like i was this master multiplier in one way but actually Hmm. didn't understand what i was doing in another way when i reflect back on it now and that that moment of always always kind of stuck with me Right. So, so we're going to turn uh, it back to you. What would be a <laughs> moment that sticks with you? Uh, As again, mine is kind these, of a negative thing, but you can be right. positive or negative. 
I have these moments in time, and I got to say, they're not. Uh, some of them are more negative than positive, yeah. which is interesting because I've always most loved of math. them are. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. Exactly. Right. That's, yeah, that's, right. that's, that's sad. I mean, it, it right. is a it is a big message that we'll come back to when we talk about fluency. That um, there's kids carry so many negative memories from the fluency work. Mm-hmm. So I'll pull from my fluency life. Sure. Um, I remember um, the planetary system. And if you mastered your threes, then you your little person got out to Earth. And as you went out, you know, on your hmm. memorizing your facts, you moved out. And whoever got to Pluto first, because Pluto was a planet at the time, um, <laughs> was like the first one to, you know, master their multiplication facts. Well, I got sick. I think I might have been on Saturn. <laughs> I got sick, hmm. and I was so sure. Was it something to do with school. the air, like on Saturn? Like what? <laughs> what do you? <laughs> I was pretty happy there, but I really was the wanted gases. to be the first yeah. one to Pluto. So I got sick and I just sat at home worrying about whether somebody was going to get to Pluto. While I was so <laughs> sick. How tragic is that? Mm-hmm. Um, and now I'm so opposed to those uh, right. kind of bullet boards that compare um, students' memories. Uh, and then that's... another thing I would share about myself, <laughs> if I get a second one, oh, uh, for sure, <laughs> is that uh, fast forward to high school. And I really um, realized about myself that I loved hard problems where I hadn't been told how to figure them out. Mm. And I, um, while I'm very gregarious and social in um, my um, world outside of math, I don't really want to talk to somebody when I'm doing a math problem. So I had a real identity awareness thing that when I'm doing these tough problems, I really just want to think. I don't want to be with a partner. I don't want to you know, do anything. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so, uh, anyways, I, I've learned that I'm um, that I like to talk about a problem after I figured it out, and everyone's different in that way. Some people mm-hmm. like to, you know, vet ideas, you know, collectively. Uh, but um, but I would love doing those tough problems, and when I would come to school the next day to share homework, um, then people would be like, "Jenny, did you figure out number whatever the hard one?" <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that put big pressure on me to figure it out, but I figured right, it out. Right, so. Right. Um, so I love that feeling. Well, I, I love to just hearing in your your message, especially the second one here, uh, the message around identity and that we have to be aware of the learners in our room. And, you know, while J- John and I often are promoting collaboration, you know, there's the caveat that, you know, we have to also understand that for some students that might be very uncomfortable. And we have to also understand that that might not be how they choose to think and 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 learn. So we have to be very flexible and, and supportive with students in our classrooms that it's not a one size fits all. I think in education and, and just human nature is, you know, we're sort of all or nothing type creatures. Like we like to, you know, it's like yes or no. There's like the in-between is really difficult for us. And I, I think that connects really to our conversation around fact fluency as well, because I think we have this on off idea. It's like you, you know, your facts or you don't, or, you know, you do it in a really boring, mundane memorization sort of way, or you don't know them at all. And there's no in between, there's no other uh, opportunities. And I'm sure your messaging today is going to help to highlight that that's actually not the case. Um, So I'm wondering, based on those experiences and where you are now, you had referenced this experience in your own teaching uh, journey where students were you know, either blindly following steps, we call it rushing to algorithms, right? Where it's like, hey, I see a multiplication problem, you know, Mr. Orr told me that this is what you do when there is multiplication with, you know, three digit by two digit or whatever it might be, instead of really zooming out and reasoning through problems. I'm wondering for you, you had just said in your secondary classroom, you started to realize, or as a student, you started to realize that you enjoyed more challenging problems. I'm wondering, you know, how did that help you maybe get to this place in your journey earlier as a teacher? Because I know for John and I, our experiences, I'll be honest and say, I didn't like the hard problems because it exposed me as actually, you know, who I really was, which was a memorizer. You know, it it exposed me as actually not being maybe as mathematically proficient as maybe I thought I was based on the grades I was getting. Um, Do you think that experience had impacted like maybe the you know, the speed at which you you landed in this place where you're like, whoa, 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 we need to do something here with fact fluency. Like we need to help students build strategies and actually reason through problems. I'm always curious about how long that took you because it took me, I feel like a very long time before I started to realize like, 
this isn't really working for all of my students. Um, I had a rough first year of teaching. Um, and like I said, my students didn't like the class and I totally took, uh, took it to heart that I wasn't teaching in a way that was reaching them. And so what I noticed is like, they wouldn't do the story problems that were at the end of a page. And I thought, haven't they figured out that the story problems at the end of the page use the same math? They were just practicing. They, can, mm -hmm. they don't even right. need to read the story. They can just lift the numbers out. <laughs> and um, so then, of course, I had students who didn't figure that out. They knew they could just lift the numbers right. out and do whatever they'd just done, you know, 25 times in their practice set. So um, I'm in my second year of teaching and I did do all this professional development. I took graduate courses that focused on these brand new draft version of the standards about reasoning, problem solving. And so I came into my second year thinking, I am not going to be that skill teacher. That was right. that did nice. not connect to my students. That didn't work. Um, it, I had a lot of the same students that next year. And day one, we just started with stories. It could be from the end of the um, page of the problems in the book, but I would do it first. Or I'd go find what they'd call enrichment and I'd pull that story in or I'd go look for other resources in the textbook series. I hadn't really yet discovered um, that there were idea books out there. So I really had my textbook and not much else. Um, and it was pre-internet. Um, so where do you get your ideas from? Either in your head or in your textbook. That was it. Um, and I noticed this dramatic change in my students in September where they were like excited to be in a group. I'd, I'd put them in a group, I'd put them in group roles and they'd have a problem to solve. And it was phenomenal. The very same students I've had the year before. It wasn't like I got better students. They were mm -hmm. just mm -hmm. more engaged. I never had a behavior problem. I'd had so many behavior problems the year before. And it was in part, I had more of a presence in the classroom, but a lot of it was that I decided to use like stories and problems mm. and group work. Um, wow. Well, so, sounds like yeah. curiosity. I was there. I was there year one. And so then part of me now is how mm. can we still be, you know, teaching skills based? Like, haven't you right. noticed that it doesn't connect to kids and it doesn't get them where they need yeah. to be in terms of their, their lives? Like, exactly. You know, well, I, I find that uh, like you're in, in year one, you said, you know, like you're, you hear from your students that you're like not helping them in a certain way. And, and I think we get stuck. Teachers uh, get stuck in this, this loop of hearing kids that they're like, oh, you're trying to like give them algorithms, give them procedures. Like you were in year one, like we were up to like year 10 and then, and congrats for you for doing it in year two and making, <laughs> you did change. it in we, one tenth the we, time, we which took I a long think time is amazing to, to all of a sudden change. But I think we, you know, I think when I reflect now, like it took 10 years of me hearing my students go, I'm not very good at math. I'm having trouble with these algorithms to me going, okay, let me, let me speak louder and let me speak slower <laughs> to telling you this thing again because we hear we're hearing like you're not helping me so then we're like well i want to help you the most so i gotta i gotta actually tell you exactly how to do it because that's the way we get stuck in thinking how to help kids is tell them how to do things instead of letting them you know experience letting them learn through story which i think you know took us so long to learn just like like it took you quickly to learn about storytelling like i think that's that fuels the work that we're doing now you know, with Make Math Moments is teaching through problems, teaching through stories that we realized just like you did early that kids actually connect to that better. And that's how we can get a window into helping them, which is really what we're we're trying to do. But we needed to realize we're helping them in a different way. I want to uh, I want to kind of make sure that we get into the work that you're working, you know, been doing for the last few years. And I, wa I want to start with fact fluency specifically, and because I think I think it's a great place to start because I think there's a lot, especially being a middle school and high school teacher and thinking and hearing that so many teachers are saying kids just don't know their facts. And here in Ontario, a few years ago, our our curriculums changed, you know, and, and parents are saying our kids need to know their basic facts. The government is saying, hey, we need to know our basic facts. We got to make sure that we're putting fact you know, uh, basic fact, professional development into our professional development days. Like it became this big thing here specifically in Ontario to get back to the facts. And I think there's what we've, you know, realized and knew, I guess, in the last, you know, many years when this happened, that, that knowing facts from what parents are saying and what the government is saying is a lot different than what you're talking about and what we've come to realize about fact fluency. So I'm wondering if you can like highlight like this, this kind of 
this mis this miscommunication between what knowing your facts is and and also like what fluency is because i think when we talk fact fluency teachers go oh i know what that is let me just drill and kill because then they'll memorize it and memorization mm -hmm. is fact fluency where we know you you don't believe exactly that and and mm -hmm. uh so i'm wondering if you want to fill in some some gaps here from our listeners who are going like wait a minute i, I thought that's what it was too like what what is it? Yeah, John, um, you've really captured the essence of the challenge around fact fluency. So um, I'll jump in with some highlights. First of all, I think we all agree that we want this thing at the end, which I'm going to call automaticity. Right. Um, and that is that when a student sees at nine plus six, they're like 15, or they see seven times three, 21, and that they can do it about, you know, that quickly without putting a lot of thought into it. How we get there. Um, is um, the what's up for debate. And so there's this pressure, you know, to get there as fast as possible. And that pressure to get there as fast as possible is leading to ineffective practices. And they're ineffective in terms of the learning of the math. And then they have this detrimental emotional impact on students. So uh, for example, you mentioned memorizing. So one way to learn um, seven times three is to memorize it. You look at it, you see it, you know, you send it home, you keep having it flashed in front of you and you have it down and then you're put in a time situation, which is, the, I'll get to the assessment later, but um, then, you know, you're just memorizing it. Another way to learn seven times uh, three is to know your doubles, uh, two sevens is 14, and that's one more seven as a bridge plan to where you become automatic. And um, then same thing with nine plus six is that, if, if you can think about nine plus six as um, 10 plus six and one less, then mm -hmm. not only do you get there very quickly, but you have a strategy that's going to serve you really well for 99 mm -hmm. plus six, 99 plus 26 mm -hmm. and so forth. So um, when you teach students, when students memorize, they literally it is stress inducing because they have no backup. If they forget, you put them in a stressful condition and they forget like, like we can do, you know, you hear of like people in crisis that forget their phone numbers and, you know, things like that. Like that's what we've done when we pair memorizing and time tests, we are just mm -hmm. doing the worst. We're pairing two of the worst things together, but they can come to know those things. Um, the, uh, they can get to automaticity through the strategy instruction. Then what comes along with it is their number sense. And it's their number sense that leads to that positive math identity and that we talked about earlier. So uh, I'll stop there. There's a lot more to the story of how to do that, but it's definitely strategies over memorizing and, um, you know, using that as a bridge to get to the automaticity. I love it. And I, I think honestly, what I'm hearing, and we use this word a ton on the podcast and throughout any of the workshops that we're doing, John and I were in, in Texas last week, and I use this word so many times. And it's really, it sounds like you're asking students to be reasoning pretty much at all times, right? And I mean, eventually you, they'll get to a place where they don't need to reason anymore. Like to me, that's sort of like that place where we get automaticity. You've been reasoning through these problems and thinking about, hmm, what does it mean? Like whether it's addition and saying like, when I'm adding nine plus six, what does that really mean? And in my mind, you had given the example of like 10 plus six minus one. That's like, you're you're kind of reasoning through that. And eventually that will turn into this automaticity where I don't need to think about it anymore. I just know it, right? And that knowing and having confidence is great. And, and the other piece I'm hearing from what you're, what you're sharing is when things do get tough, like let's say you're in a stressful situation, hopefully not a time test. That's not the stressful situation we're talking about. <laughs> But, you know, in life, there are going to be stressful situations when you can then pause and go, let me reason through this again. Even though I, I feel like I know the answer to this problem, usually because I'm stressed, it's not coming to me. I can actually think about this problem. And then these strategies and these models sort of come to come to fruition. Now, I know there's a big, big, like there's no way we'll unpack it all in this episode, but just to get people sort of 
maybe an appetite for digging into some of the figuring out fluency uh, series of books. And I know you have a general book, but then you also have different, um, you know, different aspects. Like, uh, for example, one of the latest ones is operations with rational numbers and algebraic equations. Uh, may not sound super like intriguing at front at first, but when teachers think about, wait a second, my students struggle with fractions, they struggle with algebra. It sounds like, wow, if I could do this in a way that's going to build automaticity so students can be reasoning through problems and then feel comfortable with these, you know, traditionally challenging subjects for students, I think it's definitely worth digging into. So there are components uh, outlined in your books about building procedural fluency, which I think everyone thinks math facts and it's like procedure. But I mean, we work towards it. We work towards that automaticity. What are the components in general for people to be kind of thinking about when they are trying to help their, maybe their children or their students develop fluency? The simplest way um, that I would um, frame it is putting students in a decision-making role. So they're deciding, how am I going to solve this? Instead of being told, this is how you solve this, this is how you solve this, and this is how you do this. So to me, it's about decision-making. And so to bridge from the nine plus six example, another way we could solve nine plus six is we could uh, move one over and have it be 10 plus five, right? So that's a strategy, a make 10 strategy that graduates up to whole numbers, where if you have, you know, 29 plus 16, then you can move one over and now you have 30 plus 15. And then you get to the book you're talking about with rational numbers and it's not make tens anymore, but you could make a whole. So if you Mm -hmm. have like two and three fourths plus two and three fourths, again, you're starting with decision making. How do I want to solve this problem? Ooh, I could move one fourth over and Mm -hmm. make a whole. Now I've got an easier problem I want to solve. Um, And then the same thing is true when you get up into the um, algebra examples, but you have this idea of teaching for fluency is teaching a strategy, helping students generalize that strategy so that they can use it. And then you add another one to the repertoire. And so pretty soon they have more than one option and they can start choosing strategies. So that's the Mm -hmm. lifelong trajectory from kindergarten when their one option is counting to (laughs) them adding onto their repertoire, you know, a small set of strategies so that when they look at a, you know, a problem, um, whether it's whole numbers, fractions, proportions, equations that they ask themselves. How do I, what, which of my things in my repertoire do I want to use first? That's, right. that's teaching for fluency. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I think like when you, when you're saying these things and I'm, I'm just reminded of the, you know, the three big kind of components that you've talked about in your books about, about, uh, you know, procedural fluency. And, and when you say like this adopt the strategy or select a strategy, I'm just reminded of like that, that, that flexibility piece. And I've, mm-hmm. and I've been like hooked on the flexibility piece for the last year or two on, on, and I, I teach a high school classes and about trying to help my students become more flexible with strategies. And, and I think that part is what m- many of us have missed along the way is how do we teach kids to be flexible with strategies and 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 say and also models um uh to help them you know solve problems because i think that's that's a part like we all talk about you know procedural fluency but what does that really mean right it's like oh that means like let's just get them to accuracy like let's just get them to like pump out a right answer instead of like well how do we get to that right answer like how can we teach kids to be more flexible and and you're 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 talking you know you're suggesting we got to teach different strategies um i'm wondering if you have any like tips and suggestions for teachers like i know i guess i know you have tips and suggestions for teachers that's what you've been writing about um for for how a teacher can get started with just thinking about the mindset in your classroom with teaching flexibility to kids. Like I, I, I'm just imagining a teacher, like a, let's say a seventh grade teacher is going in and go like, I want to like focus on teaching my kids strategies and flexibility this year. I've been in a place where I, I mostly did direct instruction and taught procedures straight up the way that I was taught, the way I taught for a long time. How do I go about making that shift? So it's manageable. What would, what would you say Mm. to a teacher like that? So, um, it starts with access. Like, do they actually know how to use a strategy? So that can be very intentional. Right. Like when they look at two and three fourths plus two and three fourths, 
um, for the, for you to help them see options um, with, with proportions. You know, there's not just the cross product approach. Oftentimes, there's um, a number relationship where you can um, solve the problem without having to enact that uh, longer procedure. Um, with uh, equations since you brought up high school, you know, eliminate parentheses is not always your first step. And so we have to like, just mm-hmm. look at the things where we're saying to students, the first thing you do is blank. Um, so remove that, but we teach them, you know, the options. So that's the beginning. And then we have these regular opportunities to choose among strategies. And that can be done through um, routines to start class with, um, or which can be part of the lesson or can be separate. So one of the ones that I really like um, that's in the books is um, strategize first steps. And I like it for high school. I like it for all grades, but the advantage is if you're only thinking about your first step, then it's a much quicker routine than if you have to solve the whole problem. So you're just thinking about what would you do first on this problem? And so Mm -hmm. you put problem number one up and it's just a form of a number talk and students share what they might do first because that's brainstorming. That's giving them time at the front end to think, how, what are my options here? How could I solve this? And they see you create a menu from that first problem. Then you put up another problem. And um, so they um, they can either pick from the menu that's up there how they would solve the second problem, or they can add to the menu. You put up a third problem and a fourth problem. Well, strategically, you've come up with problems that fit different strategies. So one might lend to, if it's computation you're working on, for addition. One of them might be making 10. One of them might lend to compensation. One of them might lend to partial sums. And one of them might be uh, got nothing. I'm going to use my standard algorithm, you know, so, Mm -hmm. uh, but that menu goes up and they see that. Well, then that sets up if they're going to be working on a practice set where the purpose of the practice set is choosing, you know, your best option for the numbers and the problems. So that instead of telling the students solve using blank method, you're saying solve using an efficient method. And that's those components you're talking about, um, uh, John, when you said, uh, you know, the flexibility, the efficiency and the accuracy, because they're a package deal. When you're choosing an efficient method, you're more likely to be accurate. And the flexibility comes in making those choices. Mm, I love it. I love it. And, you know, the word, like another word coming to mind for me is like the behaviors, like understanding the behaviors of how the operators are working and then students being given the opportunity to essentially strategize based on what they're bringing to the table. And, you know, a question John and I receive a lot is how do you assess? And I think when people say assess, I think sometimes they confuse it with evaluate. People are thinking like, how do I evaluate fact fluency? And we sort of push it back to this idea of assess because it's like, no, we want to help students build their repertoire, but we don't want to necessarily evaluate, you know? So an example I always use is I teach students how to double and have and how that can be a really helpful, you know, uh, strategy, but I very rarely use it myself. You know, I'm like more of like when I'm multiplying, I'm a distributive property, partial product sort of guy. And that's what I tend to lean on. So this idea of efficiency, I think, you know, you're you're kind of leaving it open for interpretation for students, right? Because I think what's efficient for John or what's efficient for Jennifer, or what's efficient for me might be different depending on where we are and, and how we're reasoning through a problem. So I'm, I'm loving these ideas here. Um, I'm wondering if you could help an educator make one small change. So we're recording this, it is summertime here, but some US schools are heading back now. And if a teacher is listening to this and they're saying, I want to make one small change that's not going to throw out the baby with the bathwater or anything else, you know, maybe there's other places or other things they want to change in their math program, but they want to add one little small change to help get them closer to working on fluency with their students. What sort of routine or change or, you know, idea might you suggest for them to squeeze in there that isn't going to leave them, you know, up for nights thinking about it um, as they try to restructure what they usually do, um, you know, in years past. Uh, So here's the first thing that came to mind when you um, were asking that question is um, in your textbooks um, or your worksheets that oftentimes in the instructions says how to solve the problem. So a simple thing you can do is just audit your instructions. And when it says solve using blank, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. then just draw a little line through it. (laughs) 
you don't have to stay up nights thinking about that. Just draw a line through it or get your whiteout out and then just replace it with something that's more of a fluency instruction. So um, in elementary school, there's a lot of instructions that say solve using the standard algorithm. Mm -hmm. You could not cross that out. You could say solve using the standard algorithm when it's needed. <laughs> you know, right. Otherwise, use a strategy of your choice, but alter the instructions so that you've offered an invitation to choose an efficient method. Mm. Yeah, I like that. I like that specifically uh, as a, as a great example. I'm 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 reflecting right right now on your chapter of your book about uh like like practice work, like homework or not homework. It was uh, worksheets. It was like thinking about how mm -hmm. do we build a good worksheet. And Kyle and I actually just um, a couple months ago uh, did a webinar on how you know how do you make a a great worksheet and and how do you use worksheets. And we actually referenced your work. Um, in that in that webinar specifically when uh, you discussed about like a work you know building fluency or or automaticity isn't like a full worksheet of, of 20 plus problems it's a I liked how you described that you know like hey give practice problems where you're saying like which of these problems would be great to use this strategy for and which ones would you not use this strategy for? Like, I thought that was such a great kind of tweak you can do with say existing worksheets already, because some of them, you know, you know that these worksheets are created almost like by computer and mm -hmm. they're not meant to be used with say a particular strategy. And I think that was also a, a great point from your, from your work on, on when you're thinking about the work that you're doing, like a particular skill, it's, I want to highlight a strategy and which, which problems or what examples can I use to highlight the strategy and not specifically that particular outcome? Cause like we teach strategies first and then the say, uh, specific outcomes kind of follow. Uh, I thought that was a, a great point. So I, I, I love that tip that you're giving teachers, uh, if they're trying things for the first time this, this school year. One more thing before we go uh, here, uh, Jennifer, is I know that when I started started the episode, we talked about like how to change some mindset about like this idea of of understanding basic facts into what we're trying to talk about here. I'm wonder a lot of the push that we hear is from parents, and I think that's what happened here in Ontario when uh, we had a government change and like we're going back to facts, and and everyone kind of got mm -hmm. got their you know wires cross about what that is. We've chatted about that here, but I think there's still a lot of parents that are still saying, but this is what basic facts means. And this is what, you know, my kid needs to know the basic facts. Why aren't you sending home worksheet after worksheet? Like what can you do worked for me? Right. Like, yeah. I, I guess, I guess what, what can you help our teachers right now who are going in into this school year going like, I want to do this too. I know I'm going to get pushback from parents. Like, what do I say to them so that I can convince them that this is the right way for your kid to learn their basic facts? So one thing that I like to do with uh, families, because they do know their basic facts, is to move up to two digit numbers and give a problem that could be solved lots of ways um, that are does not lend to the standard algorithm. So right. for example, 49 plus 48 and then they're at an open house or something. So they get to meet a parent next to them, share how they solved it. Um, they get to talking, they feel joy. And then you bring them back together and you're like, this, this is how our math learning is going to be. And so how did, you know, you can debrief as much or as little as you want. But when a parent says, well, I pretended both were 50 mm -hmm. um, and then I fixed it, say, okay, so with basic facts, when you add like nine plus six, you could do 10 plus six, pretend it's a 10 and fix it. Mm -hmm. And um, another person might've moved one over. And so you can connect it back to the basic fact strategies and they can see that there's value in learning the strategies because their child will develop stronger number sense mm -hmm. and they're going to be poised and ready to go beyond the basic facts. So again, you're talking to the parent about the benefits for their child rather than like bash all the, all the yeah. problems yeah. with basic facts, which yeah. I've spent decades doing literally. Right. Um, but for families, you, you want them to walk out feeling assured that their child's going to get really solid yeah. beginning to math and really like math. I, I, love I, find, it. I find that amazing too, because I think, I think you're right. Like when you ask a parent to do that, they're actually going to use their mental math strategies that they've developed outside of school. Like they're outside schooling, school. right? Like I, I feel like mm -hmm. I've, I've got those strategies now too, but when I reflect back to my schooling, 
I don't think I was ever shown what you're talking about. That's we right. would have done the algorithm and they're saying right. like, go into the algorithm, but that's not the way I do it actually in my head. So I really like that example. Yeah. Um, we're taking it from the outside. We're bringing right. it inside our math class. Right. We're going to make sure the students have access to the best ways of you know, reasoning. Right. Yeah. If you, if you speak with, you know, carpenters or like, you know, my, we'll call it the Jack of all trades. Like my dad's a, a Jack of all trades. I am not, uh, <laughs> but he is. And yes. like when he's yes, working with a tape measure and he's using strategies, he can't quite articulate the why, like he can't art, but when he shares how he does things, I'm like, oh, that's like a great strategy. Like, you know, like you've, you've actually, uh, similar to your, your, um, example earlier there, Jennifer on like, taking the the one fourth and pushing it over. It's like, oh, you use the commutative property and the associative property. That's fantastic. And when, you know, I think when adults start to make that connection, like John, you were just saying, it's like, you've, you've figured out strategies, which is great. It's awesome. But imagine if we could help all students figure them out sooner and not just sort of land on them by chance uh, through life. That would be so fantastic. Uh, I, I love it. Um, something I've done with uh, with parents when I go in schools and they do parent nights, sometimes I'll give them something maybe a little more challenging and then work our way backwards. So, for example, giving them a proportion on a double number line and, and, and parents can see it coming to life and mm -hmm. almost like have this, you know, this epiphany for themselves like, wow, that would have been really helpful mm -hmm. to have when I was younger and uh, while I'm on proportional reasoning and the double number line and all the magic that happens there, um, before we wrap things up, Jennifer, uh, I wanted to share one of my favorite resources is the Teaching Developmentally book, which is has just released the 11th edition. I'm not sure how it can get much better because it was awesome, but I'm sure there's some new nuggets in there that are definitely worth exploring. So specifically for those who have ignored our you know our suggestion over many podcast ep episodes <laughs> to come and check out this book uh it really does change how you look at things as mathematics gets more complex especially like for me understanding ratios rates proportionality that has really shifted my own thinking. I know John has been on this journey as mm -hmm. well. So we wanted to take a, a chance to share that with those who are unaware. Go check it out if you haven't yet. So many things to be learned in there. And uh, Jennifer, you are one of the authors of that series. And uh, yeah, we appreciate that work that you're doing. So before we wrap up, where can the Math Moment Maker community learn more about you and your work around number fluency, fact fluency, and then all things mathematics. Well, uh, I don't have a website, uh, but I'm happy to um, engage. Uh, I'm at lots of conferences and um, to I, I have been writing a lot. So I feel like the ideas we've talked about are in the little purple book, Math Fact Fluency, and then the Figuring Out Fluency series that goes beyond basic facts. Um, there's the uh, Rainbow book and then all the classroom companions full of activities. And then this is, you know, just all things um, teaching math and with a stronger focus on proportions, by the way, and <laughs> fluency. My favorite. And uh, and uh, culture and language as well. So many, many changes in this edition. Um, so I'll be at um, the NCTM annual conference and other places. And as I have time, I'm a professor, but as I have time, I um, do travel to districts and schools. So I'm happy to engage in the dialogue anytime I can. Awesome stuff. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, we are also traveling uh, to uh, the national conference uh, this September. So hopefully we can see you face to face there. We'll try to uh, meet up with you, Fantastic. but uh, thanks so much for joining us. And uh, we look forward to chatting with you again. Thanks, John and Kyle. I've Have a great it. day, my friend. We'll see you no. soon. Yeah, we'll see you in Los Angeles. Well, as always, Math Moment Makers, uh, you know, John and I are big on finding ways to reflect that resonate with you, that work for you. So uh, how are you going to do it? How are you going to make sure that this information doesn't wash away like footprints in the sand? Are you going to write it down? You're going to tweet it out. You're going to put it on Facebook. You're going to comment at the bottom of the show notes page on our makemathmoments.com website. Whatever you do, make sure that you are finding a way to reflect and maybe set a little mini goal um, mm. that you can apply in your practice uh, moving forward. 
in order to ensure you don't miss out on our new episodes as they come out every Monday morning. Be sure to subscribe here on your podcast platform. Also, these episodes are visual. You can watch uh, us uh, talk with Jennifer Bay Williams or all of our guests over on YouTube. Uh, You can head on over there to watch and subscribe over there as well. Math Moment Makers, uh, you know that we read every review that comes in, uh, whether it be on Spotify, on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts. When they come to us, uh, we our hearts are, are filled, just like this one by JC Riley 09. It says, must listen every week. It's a five-star rating. I'm a math mm. teacher of 11 years, and this weekly show has evolved me into a better educator The mix Mm. of experts, teachers, district leaders gives me multiple perspectives and experiences on how to make math learning better for the kids in the classroom. My lessons have become more engaging and my teaching practice has really pushed forward. So awesome job there. That was by JC Riley 09. You are fantastic. That was on the U.S. Apple Podcast Store. Uh, what country are you coming to us from? Uh, we'll take them in the United States. That's great. We got lots of them on there. If you're coming to a country like Canada, where you know we have less of those reviews, or maybe you're coming from the other side of the world, make sure you leave us a rating and review. That'll not only let us know that we're meeting the needs of educators out there, but it'll also tell uh, Google and all those search engines that, hey, this is a must-listen podcast for educators. Show notes and links to resources and complete transcripts uh, can be read from the web or download and take with you. Hey, hey, head on over to the show notes page, uh, makemathmoments.com forward slash episode 197. Again, that's makemathmoments.com forward slash episode 197. While you're over there, hit that tasks page and check out some of those problem-based units. Well, until next time, Math Moment Makers, I'm Kyle Pierce. And I'm John Orr. High fives for us. And a big high five for you.